So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the Euro Eurozone and European Union as a whole uh, um, during and after the crisis. Um, obviously, uh, I'm particularly focused in the UK, but I've been watching with a, um, a mixture of fascination and horror uh, what has been happening in, in the Eurozone uh, as well for the last few years. Um, and so I will try to say very briefly, obviously, since uh, uh, half an hour is not a long time, uh, how what, what I, I guess is, is uh, um, um, diagnosis, prescription, and prognosis. I, how did we get into this mess? What have we been doing since we got into this mess? And, and what results has it produced? And, and uh, where, where do we go from here? And, and what happens next? Uh, so uh, let me start with this. How did we get into this mess? Um, I think the, the first thing to emphasize, uh, which I think is reasonably well accepted among most economists now, um, but still not among the general public and not in, in, among some of the economists who most matter, uh, whether in, in Frankfurt uh, um, uh, or in uh, Brussels, um, is that um, while fiscal policy in the run-up to the crisis was clearly far from optimal, um, and that applies uh, to the UK, it applies to Ireland, it applies to Spain, and it uh, obviously applies to Greece. Um, uh, while fiscal policy um, was not optimal, and had we run more sensible uh, and prudent fiscal policies in the run-up to the crisis, uh, and again, that applies to uh, all of the above countries, uh, as well as, of course, to Italy um, and, and, well, Greece. It wasn't just a question of running more prudent fiscal policy, but really having a fiscal policy at all or a policy on the, uh, uh, the size and shape of the state and where the money to, to fund the state should come from. Um, uh, we would have been in better shape to deal with the crisis had we had more sensible fiscal policies. Um, but fiscal policy was not the cause of the crisis. Um, the cause of the crisis was the... Uh, um, uh, um, Cause of the crisis um, for the world economy, as we know, um, was uh, um, a combination of uh, structural imbalances in the uh, uh, structural imbalances in the system, in particular, uh, the uh, excessive current account deficits of the U.S., uh, the excessive current account savings, uh, current account surplus of savings of the Chinese, and so on, a combination of that with uh, lax financial regulation um, uh, in the U.S., uh, one step down the global pecking order in the U.K., and then, of course, one step down the further down the global financial pecking order right here in, in Dublin, all of the... Yeah. Um, these, these are the, the cause of the global financial crisis, um, but then, of course, following the global financial crisis, uh, we then had a second secondary uh, crisis uh, caused not uh, caused by the global financial crisis, but not uh, the same, which was the crisis in the eurozone. Um, and this, you know, does need to be seen as conceptually separate. Uh, the U.S., U.K., eurozone, and so on, uh, all had the global suffered the global financial consequence. And its, uh, uh, and its after effects, and of course we in the UK um, are still suffering its after effects. Uh, however, the Eurozone had a second crisis, um, which was caused by a combination of um, imbalances within the Eurozone uh, interacting with the, uh, with the design features of the Eurozone. Um, but once again, let me emphasize that, that there is really li little or no evidence suggesting that that crisis was caused by imprudent fiscal policies among, among those countries. The imbalances uh, were reflected in large current account deficits um, by some countries, Ireland among them, uh, and large current account surpluses among other countries, uh, uh, Germany among them. And it was the unwinding, the unsustainability and unwinding of those uh, imbalances uh, which led to the crisis, which in turn led to sovereign debt crises um, in this country and, and in others. And, but the causality uh, goes, uh, goes that way. And um, 
I here once again I would emphasise what what Paul Krugman has said uh, and Simon Ren Lewis in, in in the UK that economics is not a morality play. It is not about uh, virtuous savers uh, uh, and profligate debtors. It is not about uh, bad bad debtors and and prudent creditors. Um, macroeconomics uh, is about trying to, in my view, trying to understand these um, identities, savings, investment, surpluses and deficits, what, and then the causal relationships that underlie them, um, and what you need to do to bring them back into balance in a way which allows the economy to get on with growing in the way which it will do if you can uh, run the macroeconomy in a reasonably sensible way. Uh, but let me turn briefly then to this, this question of current versus capital imbalances, uh, debtors and creditors, uh, um, chicken eggs. And uh, you know, this is quite an important and, and live debate at the moment. Um, uh, and it does play into this view of, of economics as a morality play. There is one point of view, uh, let us call it the, the German point of view, um, which says that what happened in the run-up to the crisis uh, in countries like Spain, Italy, Greece, Ireland to some extent, um, was that uh, a progressive that the, there was a progressive deterioration in competitiveness. Uh, these countries allowed their labor costs to get out of control. Uh, they were therefore, uh, they were paying themselves too much. Um, they were consuming more than they were producing. And in order to, uh, um, they were exporting less than they were importing. Um, and therefore, they had to borrow. Um, and so, the competitiveness led to the problem of overconsumption, um, which in turn led to uh, capital flows uh, from outside those countries into places like uh, uh, um, Ireland uh, to build houses and so on, uh, and Spain. Um, the flip side of that, of course, is that actually it's a, uh, um, a capital account story, which is that what happened was that we had um, Imprudent borrowers and imprudent lenders. Uh, uh, you in this country know very well who, uh, that there was a lot of imprudent borrowing going on, both by households and business businesses um, and by the <coughs> banks here who, in order to lend imprudently to households and businesses, needed to borrow imprudently, uh, which they largely did on international money markets and the like from, uh, ultimately, uh, places like Germany. Uh, and the view there is that the excessive liberalization and lax regulation of the financial system, part of which I described earlier, um, led to these capital flows from not just to imprudent debtors, but from imprudent creditors. In other words, uh, the capital account drove the current account. It was these capital account flows from imprudent creditors including, among them, clearly, German banks and other, other institutions which participated in, uh, um, on international money markets uh, that drove the imprudent debt buildup and, in turn, drove the excessive consumption um, in countries uh, uh, like Ireland and Spain. Um, now, in some ways, uh, you know, establishing causality here is, is not just difficult, but it's not clear that it's conceptually possible. These are two sides of the same coin. The capital account is the obverse of the current account. And um, if you don't think economics is a morality play, um, then it is not really a question of, of, of who precisely was being uh, uh, imprudent, but uh, what the mechanisms were and, crucially, how, what, how you deal with them when, when they come undone. Um, however, I do think it's worth uh, um, pointing at uh, um, one piece of evidence, uh, because, you know, and this is not to say that I particularly take sides on the current versus capital account story. Uh, um, I don't, partly because I th do think they are flip sides of the same story, and partly because uh, um, I'm far from being a, 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 a world <laughs> expert in these. Um, but given that we hear the current account story so much, uh, um, given that we hear that it's all about competitiveness, all the fa about the fact that Germans drove down their real wages while everyone else was letting them rip, um, it was all about the fact that the, 
that, that other countries didn't increase their productivity. Um, I do think it is worth redressing the balance by showing a chart. This is from uh, uh, Gali et al, a uh, 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 recent paper, um, uh, um, that, uh, that suggests that there is at least something um, in the, uh, the other side of the story. So this shows changes in relative tradable balance prices. In other words, this is a measure of competitiveness. What happened to your, the price of your tradable goods? Not prices overall, not unit labor costs, but the price of your tradable goods um, compared to what happened in your current account balance in the decade running up to the crisis, 98 to 2007. And so what this shows um, is really not very much, actually. Um, in other words, um, countries on the far right, um, well, some countries like Spain uh, did have a substantial increase in prices and saw their current account balance deteriorate. Um, on the other hand, uh, other countries like Italy and Portugal saw very little change in their uh, 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 trade balance and didn't see much happening. Um, they still got caught by the crisis. Um, on the other hand, Ireland did quite well in terms of its prices of tradable goods, actually, and of course did very well in terms of exporting, but still. Um, saw a very sharp deterioration in its current account balance. And clearly, for Ireland, therefore... Could, could I just interrupt? <laughs> yeah. um, so for Ireland, what does that tell you? Well, it rather suggests that the competitive story doesn't at least give you a very good explanation of what happened to Ireland. Um, and so... For Ireland, at least, you might think that actually the, uh, the, the, the imprudent borrowing and lending, with the emphasis being on the lending just as much as on the borrowing, uh, um, is uh, rather than the, well, you, did, you paid yourselves too much and therefore you went out and uh, spent it all on, on, on fancy imported wine or BMWs. Uh, um, now, maybe you did spend a lot of it on fancy imported wine and BMWs, but the reason you could do that was the important borrowing and lending. So for Ireland, at least, one might think that some of the causality goes that way. Meanwhile, of course, we see that Germany, while, of course, it had this huge swing in its current account balance, wasn't particularly uh, uh, related to it becoming much more cost competitive. It did become more cost competitive, but not by a huge amount. So, the, so as I say, I'm not taking sides here, but, uh, but I think the important thing here is, is to suggest that... Uh, um, it's uh, um, that there are two sides to this story, uh, and it's a rather more balanced picture than we saw. So that is uh, um, a diagnosis, um, and I'm running behind time, so I will uh, 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 accelerate a little bit. But I, but I think you know, the, the, as I say, you, even in that time, one can only uh, um, talk uh, talk about it a little bit. So um, this is some work that we did at uh, Nice here. So this is the, the prescription part. Well, what did we get? Well, what we got was coordinate uh, in response to the crisis uh, and in response to the pullback in, in, to the uh, panic in sovereign debt markets um, was coordinated fiscal consolidation. Um, and part of this story actually is to show that the uh, uh, fiscal consolidation was actually coordinated across the, uh, the, the, Euro, the, the EU as a whole, not just uh, uh, um, the, the euro area. Of course, the UK did, uh, uh, did a significant fiscal consolidation itself. Um, and indeed, what this, uh, uh, and because the UK is, of course, a major trading partner, partner for many EU countries, especially Ireland and vice versa, um, the spillover effects um, from the UK uh, uh, to the Eurozone and vice versa are just as important as the spillover effects within the Eurozone. Um, you know, the fact that we have a different currency does not mean we are not part of a, uh, an integrated trading area. Um, so what, what the, this tries to show is, uh, um, and you know, I, I was quite pleased to see a piece of analysis from the European Commission just a couple of months ago, which essentially replicates this, using a slightly different model and different specifications, but comes out with basically the same results. Um, but astonishingly, in trying to estimate the impacts of consolidation on uh, output and debt in the EU countries, the European Commission looked at every country on its own. Um, it did not at any point, until, as I say, this, this paper which came out only a few months ago, did not at any point decide, well, hang on, we're telling everybody to consolidate at the same time. We know that the, you know, the European Union, um, it, that, that while individual European economies are relatively small open economies, 
the European Union as a whole is a relatively large closed economy rather like the United States. And we know, of course, that within a large closed economy, fiscal multipliers are, for obvious reasons, going to be significantly greater than for any small open economy of its own. Um, and astonishingly, you know, they didn't even sort of uh, uh, analyze this question and decide it wasn't a, you know, a, 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 um, a, a huge problem. They, they actually never actually asked this question. This is something that we produced about 18 months ago. So it's slightly out of date, and no doubt the numbers would be somewhat different now. But this is our, our estimate, both of the impact on GDP of each country's individual fiscal consolidation program, and then the impact on GDP of each country's own consolidation program and the consolidation programs that were going on in other countries. And so you sort of get the headlines by looking at the euro area as a whole, um, which coincidentally is probably within the margin of area very similar to the UK actually, which, which emphasizes something which is not often taken into account in the UK, that we actually we are in this together as far as these uh, th this particular bit of macro strategy goes. Um, and what it shows is that at an individual level, the average impact of fiscal consolidation was about uh, uh, 2%. Um, but at a, uh, um, from the, 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 um, if you look at the, the EU as a whole, or the UK and the Euro area or Ireland together, you get a number that's more like 4%. In other words, we suffered, we in the UK suffered just as much from what was happening in the Eurozone as we did from our own domestically imposed austerity. Um, and, uh, um, and on average, that was sort of true of the, uh, uh, of the euro area as a whole. Um, and you see that uh, um, particularly for, as you would expect, um, for countries like you know, here, the Netherlands didn't consolidate very much, but still has suffered quite a bit from, uh, from what's happening elsewhere. Well, well we know that the Netherlands is a huge, uh, is, primary, is, a, in its, uh, you know, is a very small, very open economy. Um, so, um, and then, course, well, what did that do to, uh, uh, to the actual objective of all these programs? That's, uh, that is the, uh, the, the, the debt GDP story. Um, the interesting thing here, of course, uh, um, which a number of people here, possibly some in this room, remarked on when I published this, is that actually the one country where actually even after taking into account the spillover effects, things worked, uh, um, you know, at least there was some result in the sense that the fiscal path was slightly better than it would otherwise have been, even if the level of output was less. Um, why is that? Well, Ireland is not only a small open economy, but it is, a more, it is an economy that is more open to the rest of the world uh, than some of the other uh, uh, EU countries. Uh, uh, so, uh, um, you know, Ireland has, what, the same, you know, I'm not sure what the, the what's the population of Ireland? Four and a half million. Greece is... Um, Greece, Greece is bigger, uh, um, um, but you know, in in say in, in terms of the proportion of exports outside the EU to GDP and imports from outside, yeah, Ireland is considerably bigger. You know, has, has a much higher proportion than Greece. Hence, even taking into account what was going on, the, the multipliers are, you know, at least in our model, are just less in Ireland. Um, that doesn't itself mean, mean that we're not. I'm not saying that the fiscal consolidation program in Ireland was, was uh, um, optimal, um, but at least it probably did have somewhat, one of the reasons Ireland has done somewhat less badly, apart from having, you know, obviously uh, um, some important structural advantages, but compared to, to say, Italy, um, is that it is more open to the, uh, to the rest of the world. Um, now, the countervailing narrative in this, uh, which some of you may say, well, again, going back to the, to the previous discussion, was that it was all about uh, um, uh, structural reform uh, and the lack of structural change uh, in various economies, uh, in particular you know, Italy, uh, uh, Spain, Portugal, and so on, Greece, in the run-up to the crisis. Um, and so some of you may have seen this chart which purports to demonstrate that. This is from uh, uh, um, Padoan, uh, uh, Carlo Padoan, the chief economist of the OECD, and Mario, um, Marco Buti, who, uh, um, as you all know, is the EG, uh, um, the, the, the director general of, of EC, ECFAN uh, in the commission. Uh, and this is a chart they recently produced showing that uh, um, there is a positive correlation between m some measure of potential growth between 2003 and 2008 
and the extent to which countries undertook structural reform as somehow measured between 1998 and 2003. Um, well, uh, this is, I have to say, not the most convincing <laughs> chart I've ever seen. Yeah, I'm all for structural reform, uh, um, although structural reform means different things to different people uh, and means different things in different countries. Um, but to suggest that this chart explains why countries were hit by the crisis and why some countries were hit by it much worse than others and why some countries have done much worse than others since the crisis hit um, seems to me to push. Um, and the, the response here is from Antonio Fatas at Barcelona, um, who suggest, produced um, a rather different chart um, showing simply um, the, uh, 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 what, uh, uh, what had happened uh, to uh, GDP and uh, uh, compared to uh, um, what had happened to government spending. Um, during the crisis period. Again, this chart doesn't prove anything, obviously, in itself. It's just a simple correlation. But if you're going to make simple correlations and do simple charts, you get a much more better explanation of what's actually happening by just looking at the extent to which countries have or have not um, consolidated uh, or maintained uh, government spending during the crisis. Um, so where are we going now? Um, this, that quote, at the top is not me, I hasten to add. Uh, that is the commission from its report uh, um, of last week, I think, or possibly two weeks ago, uh, um, its uh, uh, autumn review. Um, how do we sustain the recovery that's now underway? Well, um, the recovery that's now underway, according to our forecast, is, is that one on the, the, the left. And I think the commission's forecast is a little bit more optimistic than that, um, but really not a lot. Um, that is not much of a recovery. Um, we, uh, um, if, if the Commission's ambition is that we should have half or one percent growth for the next uh, two or three years, uh, that is not going to feel like much of a recovery uh, to, to much of Europe. Um, and you can see that in the, the chart on the right. Um, we don't see, um, and I don't think the Commission does either, see any sharp fall in unemployment in, in Spain, Greece, uh, Italy, or France um, over the next uh, uh, year or two. I know unemployment is coming down a bit in Ireland, but it's still, um, it's still at remarkably, uh, um, remarkably high levels. Um, and that uh, um, leads me on to um, uh, a much, not better chart, but I think a, a, a sadly rather more revealing chart also from the Commission, from, their, uh, from the report that the, um, a different and, in my view, much more sensible uh, 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 Directorate General of the, uh, of the Commission, the one on uh, economic, labor, and social affairs produced uh, um, uh, about nine months ago, um, looking at um, uh, long-term unemployment. Uh, so this is long-term unemployment as a percent of the active population. Uh, showing what happened between 2008 and 2011. Um, and I have to say, what really struck me, and now this is 2011, so I'm not sure what's happened here since. Um, but I don't, you know, although the Irish economy is, is in some sort of recovery phase, I haven't seen anything to suggest long-term unemployment is falling sharply. Perhaps somebody here knows the stats. Um, but what really struck me was that not that long-term unemployment, say, in, in Greece went from 3% to 8% of the active population. You know, that, that I guess, you know, it's, it's horrible, but we knew that. Uh, or we could have guessed it. Um, it's what's the, that even in countries where, which are being pointed to as being relatively successful adjusters, um, Latvia and Ireland, I think, are the, the two ones that, that the Commission would certainly point to, uh, where... You know, supposedly this pain was necessary, but uh, uh, um, but it's been successful pain, and it's le leading us on to some of that plans, and things will get better. Um, even in these countries, um, we've seen really quite remarkably uh, remarkable rises in, in long-term unemployment. Uh, so uh, we've you know that that suggests that that in um, Lithuania, <laughs> Latvia, and Ireland. Uh, long-term unemployment has gone from about 2% of the, uh, the population to about 8% of the population. It's an extra 6% of the population in, in long-term unemployment. Now, um, if that is allowed to persist, 
that does an awful lot of long-term damage to a country. It does a lot, you know, uh, um, and uh, countries, you know, we, we, we in the UK found that out the hard way uh, in the early 80s and the early 90s. Um, there are still large parts of the UK which have never fully recovered from, uh, uh, um, from not in my view, from the structural transformation of the uh, UK economy, which, which happened in that period, which was, uh, that it seems to me was painful but necessary. Uh, we had to close the coal mines at some point. What we didn't have to do was allow those people and the communities that they lived in to essentially fall into long-term unemployment and then inactivity. Um, and I think uh, we're, given where we are now, uh, the challenge for the uh, 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 for the these countries where um, a lot of the heavy macro lifting may have been done, although there's plenty still to come here in Ireland, I understand. But the challenge is really, given where we are now, regardless of, of what we think about what the policies have been so far, is to ensure um, that uh, that those structural uh, that the structural, economic, and social damage that can follow from long-term unemployment uh, um, is not allowed to to become embedded. Um, I mean, I think you know, Ireland. I would hope has the uh, um, the, the resources, you know, institutional, human, and so on, to, to stop that. But but you can't start too soon. Um, there are some countries like Latvia where I one worries that actually the interaction of this with the demographic. Uh, 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 the, 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 the demography of Latvia, which was pretty bad already, combined with uh, what happens when you have an open labor market and your young skilled people, uh, you know, if they are not getting the jobs they want, can simply pick up and leave. Whether you worry about what, what you know, where, where Latvia will be in 10 years, and I mean that in a quite literal sense, who will be in Latvia and what will they be doing? Um, Ireland uh, uh, is not in that situation, but as I say, you. Uh, um, uh, addressing long-term unemployment seems to me, and youth unemployment seems to be to be the, the policy priority. Um, so this is a chart I stole from Carl, who I think in turn took it from the OECD. This is the OECD uh, uh, chart. Um, but so what about structural re reforms, uh, um, which are, are uh, always being thrust upon us by the uh, by the Commission? Um, as both, as I said, the call, the not doing enough structural reform is why we're in this mess, and doing structural reform will help us get out of it. Well, as I said, you know, uh, um, I'm a microeconomist by training. I do believe that ultimately, the, the, uh, um, in the long run, growth, prosperity, and all the rest of it is primarily driven by the supply side of the economy. Um, and getting, if, if by structural reform, uh, we mean getting the supply side right, I think that's, uh, you know, um, uh, it clearly is a, a sensible thing to do. However, um, I, I pick this chart because what it mean, suggests to me is, is frankly, uh, um, that, um, well, let's look at this. These, the, these are estimates done by the OECD of the uplift in GDP over the next about 30 years that would come from an ambitious set of structural reforms. Um, and so one might look at uh, uh, the, uh, the two outliers, uh, um, uh, uh, or, well, a couple of the outliers. You might look at Italy and say, okay, well, Italy's a complete mess. We all know that. Labor market's a mess. Product market's a mess. Um, so, yes, that sounds right. And then look, I don't know, say, at the Netherlands. Well, the Netherlands is a small, open, flexible economy that exports a lot. Potential for gains there is not very, okay, that sort of makes sense. But then you look at a bit more and you think, well, potential for increasing GDP by structural reform is the same as in Germany as in Greece. Really? The potential for increasing GDP by structural reform in you know, Luxembourg is almost as inefficient as Italy, and France is far, far more inefficient than Spain. Um, I just find, you know, uh, um, I am quite prepared to believe that there is substantial uh, potential for. Uh, uh, um, uh, for, for improving our long-term economic <coughs> prospects through structural reform, probably in most countries, but certainly in those, crises most, uh, those countries most affected by the crisis. But what I think this illustrates is that there is absolutely no sensible, credible consensus among economists as to what, structure, what structural reform is, 
um, what the most important structural reforms are or what the, precisely are the right structural reforms for any given country. Um, and that is something I think we have to hold our hands up rather than trying to produce uh, um, charts like this or, or scatter plots that, that tell you that structural reform is, is the way out of this. So, you know, er, we, e individual countries within the EU and the EU as a whole have got a lot to sort out. Um, but equally, uh, um, I I'm think that counting on that to get us anywhere very quickly is, is, is a mistake. It's not an excuse for not doing it. So, stepping back, how do we get out of this mess? You know, very, uh, briefly sum up, I say fiscal cannot be the necessary in some places, but is not the cure in itself. In the short term, um, we have got through the short term thanks to the ECB, and there was no alternative to that, and there still isn't. Um, we need to restore balanced growth, uh, which is a mixture of things, and I don't think it's, it's you know, it is, is far from clear exactly what is needed, needed where. Um, and we need a sensible macro policy at the Eurozone level. In particular, um, we need much looser monetary policy for the ECB, and that seems to me to be the single most <coughs> obvious and most important priority in the short term. Uh, since I wrote this slide, I think, in fact, we've seen uh, new inflation figures uh, um, suggesting that the, um, that the ECB is, that the, the, the Eurozone is tipping on, you know, teetering on the edge of deflation. Uh, we've also seen, uh, you know, the rather interesting dis uh, um, intervention by uh, um, Larry Summers yesterday, uh, uh, not yesterday, a few days ago, talking about the uh, um, sort of long-run risks of, of deflation or near deflation uh, and the need for aggressive monetary policy. But there's the politics, which we were discussing over lunch, uh, of this are, are all pretty horrible at the moment. And this is what worries me most, is that while we are in this, this lull, thanks to ECB action, uh, none of these really big political issues have really been addressed. Or if they have been addressed, they've been in, addressed in the negative, in the sense of things have been ruled out on the grounds that they're politically impossible in Germany or elsewhere. <laughs> Uh, so I am still worried. I'm worried about this, and certainly very worried about this in the case of the UK. Uh, but no doubt, if I lived in in Greece or Spain or Italy, I'd be equally worried um, that the politics on the ground are going to going to outrun the economics. Uh, um, you know, I'm not saying that is what will happen, but but that is certainly what worries me most. So I've overrun my time. So I will shut up now. There's a lot of material there, and I'd like to hear what people have to say.